independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad will be back tomorrow. Happy to have you all here on a day that's confusing. (laughs) In the last, I think, few weeks have kind of been confusing in the same way. Do I know uh, whether or not the things being talked about by, say, uh, Jake Sullivan, say, anyone with the Biden administration uh, talking about the potential for action uh, between Russia and Ukraine is true? Uh, we, We don't. No, we've been told for days, uh, weeks, actually, uh, that something is happening. Something is going to happen. Something is eminent. And yet eminent has yet to arrive. And so how do you how do you deal with all that? How do we continue to discuss what uh, would be significant in the world of military action? To say the very least, that feels like the most uh, utterly uh, understating of any sort of thing uh, that could occur here. Uh, Let's do it this way. Uh, Let's listen to Jake Sullivan talk on today about what would happen if uh, if Russia does invade Ukraine and doesn't stop there. This is a real question, a real back and forth, and here is the answer. What leads you to believe that they're going to stop at Ukraine? Well, the most important thing that the president has done uh, with respect to deterrence has been to send thousands of American service members to Poland and Romania and to work with other allies to send forces to NATO allies along NATO's east, uh, the areas that border Ukraine or border Russia. So he has been absolutely clear, the president, that we will defend every inch of NATO territory because we have an Article 5 commitment to do so, and that is a sacred obligation. And if Russia chooses to move against any NATO country, come further west into NATO territory, they will be met with the full force of American and allied might. I just want to say this uh, one time. Is it bad we're already talking about what happens if Russia, and this is just a question that's asked to a a spokesperson, it's not necessarily the president going out and saying this per se, but is it bad we're already planning on losing, uh, at least to an extent, uh, at least to the extent of, of convincing Russia not to invade Ukraine, and then deciding what would happen next. And what scares me the most, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, I wonder if people on both sides of the aisle actually feels this way, Um, but in so many scenarios, this current administration, this current president, has been incapable of backing uh, words with action. None of the action has ever met the words on almost any of these things that have occurred. Remember when he said that every American will get out of Afghanistan? That was wrong. I remember when he and the vice president said, don't show up at the border. You're not going to get in. Uh, That seems to still be wrong as report after report talks about the significant amount of people uh, still getting into this country all the time and then just being dropped off uh, throughout our country. And then we kind of lose track of those those individuals. There's so many scenarios like this that you just wonder. You think to yourself, if this ever does occur, and it's not just being inflated for the sake of distraction Uh, the terrible approval numbers. I don't know what it would be from a a political, a a move that would be much more in that arena than a reality. There are troops that are building at the border between Russia and Ukraine. That's not a lie. Uh, No one is, I think, uh, uh, inflating that version of the scenario. And so then you just, as I said, you start to uh, take those additional steps in thinking, how do we go forward no matter what happens. And do we start to, as some have, some reporters I'm very happy have, uh, really, really distrust this current administration and the way in which they're handling this? Uh, and actually, that's on both sides of the, the potential outcome, right? If this doesn't materialize, uh, you have to continue to wonder to yourself how much of it was fake. And it's, it's the fault of this administration and the way they've done everything else, uh, the way that they've handled every, And they honestly are so fearful my opinion. You can decide if it's true or not, Uh, but fearful of things like the truth that they avoid questions from reporters all the time. Uh, If you remember, obviously, our former president, when he was in office and those that truly hated uh, President Trump, uh, you'd go after all these manufactured, created, fake, lie uh, versions of things uh, that happened during his administration, whether they were true or not. uh, That was ad nauseum uh, on on the news every single day. Uh, Then you jump to the administration we have now, the inability to even answer questions. Uh, Biden runs out of rooms as questions are being lobbed at him on most days. And you think to yourself, wait a minute, if that press, all that media that attacked the former president cares so much about these sort of things, 
Don't you think they'd be trying harder to get to the truth more uh, with a Biden in office? Someone who I didn't think like anyone could trick in a conversation. I think that anybody and this is bad because he's going up against people like Vladimir Putin when I'd be worried that he couldn't beat people like Peppa Pig. And I only reference Peppa Pig because of a Kanye West story I'm going to do in a second. Uh, but that's where we're at uh, in all this. I want to play a couple other quick things, and then we're going to move on uh, from Ukraine, because as I said, we don't really know. Uh, a reporter asked the vice president uh, a couple different questions. Uh, one of those questions was about whether or not um, an invasion is definitely going to happen, as is the move of this administration. They continue to say, yes, 100 percent, there's going to be an invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but then they also say that diplomacy is still possible. Uh, and then they usually talk about sanctions. Uh, What's interesting about all of those things is that if we are for sure determined that something we don't want to happen will happen, I don't know why we then say, yeah, but we'll we'll still talk to him. Uh, We we still hope for the the Putin-Biden summit uh, that our side was saying was a thing, and then Vladimir Putin said was not a thing. But if you believe Putin has made up his mind, what leverage do you really have? Why not put those sanctions in place now? The purpose of the sanctions has always been and continues to be deterrence. <laughs> but let's also recognize. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hold on for a second. Think about that. So the reporter said, if you're positive that something that you don't want to happen is going to happen, why don't you do the thing that deters it from, you know what deterrence is, right, uh, Madam Vice President? You understand that that is supposed to prevent the action you don't want to happen. Uh, and so what your answer is, is that, no, no, no. We're going to put in the deterrent after they do the thing. That's actually my favorite answer Uh, and actually the best demonstration of how this administration gets so many things uh, wrong. If you look at, again, the border, if you look at uh, scenario after scenario, uh, they're sitting there after the thing occurred and they're like, man, when do we stop this from happening? Uh, Here's a little more. The unique nature of the sanctions that we have outlined. These are some of the greatest sanctions, if not the, the, the strongest that we've ever issued. As I articulated yesterday, it, it is directed at institutions, in particular financial institutions uh-huh. and individuals, and it will exact absolute harm for the Russian economy and their government. But if Putin is- <laughs> I'll get back to those questions in a little bit. I just love the fact that it'll, it'll affect all this change, and we'll do it. So our assumption then would be we activate the sanctions after Putin's in Ukraine, and he's just like, oopsie. Then he goes, oh, my bad. Uh, what was I thinking? I'm going to I'm going to back out of here after a military strike has started after a military invasion has started. All right. I want to shift gears, like I said, because there's just other stuff. Uh, there is more Ukraine and more uh, vice president audio out there. We'll get to that in a bit. I do want to play this, though. This is ABC's This Week. Uh, this is a Politico um, reporter talking about Biden inflation and how uh, it's been temporary, but uh, not exactly uh, in the word in the way in which most of us would define temporary. I just love the the mention of uh, the fact that this transitory inflation has stuck a lot longer than anybody thought it would. Uh, And I say anybody, meaning a certain side of the aisle. I think a lot of us did understand as it was occurring that this was going to be a long term problem. You know, Democrats, a lot of them have been frustrated with, you know, President Biden going out there and saying inflation is, quote, transitory, like it's just temporary. It's going to go away. And it's been months now. It's only gotten worse. You know, there was an interview, you know, just a few days ago where he attacked Lester Holt, calling him a wise guy for just asking questions that (laughs) American voters, whether they be Democrats, independents or Republicans, are asking is what are you going to do about inflation? Yes, that's absolutely true. He, he did say wise guy uh, when Lester Holt was like, you know, you said this was going to be short term and uh, uh, it's not yet. It's uh, still going. We're still having issues. And uh, he's like, you wise guy. I don't know what any of that is. Honestly, I don't understand what version of of this is the approach that we think we should have from a strategic standpoint from uh, these politicians, uh, the ones in power right now, uh, the vice president, the president and several others. Uh, that they're just going to walk around and, uh, I think, uh, try to act so human, uh, because I think that's why you say the wise guy thing. I think that's an attempt to be, ah, we're being human in a moment, over something utterly serious and important uh, and something that this administration seems to continue to not understand. All right, the one other thing I want to do, and then I'll get to the Peppa Pig thing, uh, but I'll probably take a break before that, because it's one of my favorite favorite stories I've seen in a while. Uh, Kanye West and Peppa Pig are feuding. Uh, And apparently that's something that the Internet loves. I usually don't like uh, what the Internet obsesses about. This is one of the times I do. Uh, But before I get to that, I want to play some interesting audio. Uh, To me, this is 
a valuable idea that I think the uh, Republican Party is probably already having. Uh, Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, former President Trump, uh, the two most likely uh, to be sitting in a position to challenge a failed Biden administration uh, that has absolutely no approval um, on it. Well, okay, very, very small amounts of approval from even their own party, uh, I think, at this point. Uh, But what I think is so interesting about all this is Tim Scott is a name that is growing. It's a name that's getting more and more valuable, I think, in the Republican Party. He was asked if he would be on a Trump ticket uh, because I think even though maybe most Republicans would like to see Ron DeSantis and Trump together on some sort of presidential ticket, that that's probably unlikely. I think that Ron DeSantis would like to give it the old college try to an extent that maybe a Tim Scott wouldn't care as much. Uh, But anyway, here is an answer to that question. Would you uh, be on that ticket? He answered it well, uh, and he actually referenced how powerful uh, former President Trump is within the party. All valuable answers, I think, to the idea moving forward that this could be a presidential ticket in the making. Well, I think everybody wants to be on, on, on President Trump's bandwagon, no, I, without any question. One of the things I've said to the president is that he gets to decide the future of our party and our country because he is still the loudest voice. What I, what I hope happens is that we rally around the principles that lead to our greatest success. Uh, I, am, I am not looking for a seat on a, a ticket at this point. I am, however, looking to be reelected in South Carolina. So my hope is that you win next Friday's football game before thinking about any other one. So that's my primary uh, responsibility. I will win this football game and then I'll look at the next one. But he did. He hinted at more than once uh, how interesting it would be, uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, for that to eventually play out while still making sure his eyes are on the correct prize. uh, And that would be the prize of getting reelected first. I even though I don't know, um, uh, to be honest, I feel like that name now has been so and he'll get reelected. Uh, but that name is so uh, significant, Tim's uh, and the uh, amount of spotlight that's been shined on him from time to time from the Republican Party is also valuable enough to be a serious or maybe it's just something that convinces a DeSantis uh, to uh, be more interested in. Right. And I, I wouldn't say that DeSantis is actually demissed it himself. I just wonder uh, if really those those worlds are are getting to a point where. Uh, they're starting to go opposite directions, and maybe they shouldn't. Uh, but we'll we'll see. That's still down the line. Obviously, a lot more uh, to happen in the world of polit- politics and elections before that, uh, as uh, Tim Scott said. All right. Uh, this is the Chad Benson Show. Craig Collins filling in. A quick break. A lot more uh, coming up in just a sec. <laughs> don't get into politics. As an ordinary suburban housewife, I feel a little disrespected. I teach my children not to name call. You are a flabberman! A flabberman! Come on, man! Um, guys, can we please keep the chatter to a minimum? Chad Benson. Just a loud mouth. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad is back tomorrow. Uh, lots and lots of things out there to discuss. Uh, some of them feel much more important than maybe the amount of, of um, attention they're getting right now. Uh, one of them is this Durham investigation, uh, this Durham report, and whether or not the things in it. I saw the New York Times said that they were all crap, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and certainly there's a lot of other, I think, uh, reactions to Uh, whether or not some of the things that have been uh, grabbing our attention at the highest levels are as significant as they sound. Um, But if there is valuable proof uh, that Hillary Clinton spied on then president of the United States, Donald Trump, that's that's a real story. I don't know why that feels uh, like it's not. Here is Ted Cruz uh, answering a question about just that. But I'll tell you, the allegations, what Durham filed in, in, in a filing in federal court, is deeply concerning. What what Durham alleged as a federal prosecutor, as a special prosecutor, is that a lawyer for the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, conspired with a big tech executive to monitor and spy on Donald Trump, to spy on him at his home, to spy on him at his office, and, and indeed they were spying on the White House itself. They were spying on a sitting president. That, that, that is, you, you know, you and I both remember when, when President Trump said the Democrats are spying on me 
And, and the corporate media collectively laughed at him. They mocked at him. They, 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 they said, what a ridiculous claim for him to make. Well, if what, what special counsel Durham is alleging is true, that what, what Donald Trump said was absolutely right. And, and to the extent Hillary Clinton is complicit with this, her campaign is complicit with it, her lawyers are complicit with it, big tech is complicit with it. If this is true, it's a lot bigger than Watergate. That was a bungled third-rate burglary. It was wrong. People went to jail for Watergate, and people need to go to jail for this if these allegations are true. That is a hot take. Uh, I would say that for sure, Uh, but an interesting one, right? And a valuable conversation to be had, even as many are saying, uh, well, you know, what she spied on and what might have been attained is not all that big of a deal. It's very interesting how the defense already comes out. All right, I wanted to touch on this. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, There was this published piece. I think it was just a a tweet out on social media uh, and a couple other things about the feuds that Kanye West has been having. Uh, Kanye West now has a Netflix documentary out there showing his rise to stardom. Uh, He is stalking, in the way I would say it, his ex-wife, Kim Kardashian, in an awkward way. But one of the people that, well, a people's not even the right word, one of the characters that popped up was Peppa Pig. I don't even remember the controversy or the feud that Kanye West had between Peppa Pig, but the Internet is resoundingly on Peppa's side. Uh, It was hilarious to watch this trend on social media. And so many say, you know what? I don't even care what the problem is. Uh, Peppa Pig has got to be in the right here. Although it might have just been that Peppa Pig is a little annoying to adults if kids get very into her. And I might side a tad with Kanye. On that. I'm not trying to say that I'm 100% with Yee on all the all the problems he's had or all the different um, uh, ways in which he's he's feuded. Uh, but if it's just simply that idea that for an adult, uh, the things your kids get very into might not be as fun for you, uh, that's, as, that's about as mild of a take as they come. But I just love it. I loved so many were like, nah, Peppa's totally innocent. Kanye's got to go. That's the thing that broke the camel's back. All right. Chad Benson Show. More Greg Collins filling in in just a bit. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to be with you. So, so much to talk about. And yet I want to keep hitting on some of the things that have been said over the last uh, 48 hours or so about the potential for an invasion uh, from Russia into Ukraine and the way in which uh, so many in this administration are like, yeah, that's a thing that's going to happen. And then also we're still willing to talk about it and prevent it from happening, which, of course, it's good uh, that the conversations uh, need to continue, want to continue to deter any kind of actual action. It's just worrisome uh, in the way in which it would sort of would be like, let me uh, equate it to sports. If you were giving some sort of uh, press thing before a uh, game, actually, the way Ben Roethlisberger literally did this and said, we're probably not going to win. We're probably going to lose. And yet we're still going to try. Uh, And that's tremendously fearful, upsetting, whatever you want to call it, just uh, um, wrong uh, because of how powerful our country is, how powerful our military is, and how uh, likely uh, a success, I think, would be if anybody else uh, were in office right now at deterring, uh, and that is the most valuable term here, uh, any sort of action with some sort of valuable uh, response so far uh, that doesn't seem to be as weak as Uh, This administration has been. But I want to play this. This is uh, a Biden spokesperson and Pentagon spokesperson, John Kirby, on Fox News on Sunday, uh, talking about what they learned from the Afghanistan withdrawal. Uh, We did that badly would be a nice start. But here's what he said. What has the administration learned from the chaos out of Kabul last August? Well, we're still digesting uh, what happened in, in August, Bill. I, I suspect your, your question. Okay, that's not good. That, that is not good, actually. If the first part is we're still figuring out how we screwed up there when we did everything wrong. 
Uh, that would be uh, that would be a, a challenge for us to to figure out why it was bad to remove so much military presence before we had all the people out, uh, and why we trusted the Taliban so much. All those were mistakes. We're trying to get to the heart of why why we made them. Uh, not great so far. Question is trying to you know get at sort of anything we learned from August that we're trying to apply now. Uh -huh. They are two very different circumstances, Bill, and there's 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 not a lot of parallel between uh, what we're seeing now in Ukraine and what we see what we saw in Afghanistan. That is not a great answer when the answer is nothing. <laughs> Essentially, uh, that's what he said. He goes, uh, we we're still they're totally different. Honestly, super different situations. However, I think the Afghanistan withdrawal might have uh, emboldened people like uh, Vladimir Putin to to feel good about certain things. All right. I want to move on. There's other stuff in the news. Uh, the CDC is keeping a lot of data that they've compiled about covid to themselves. Uh, remember, so many points throughout uh, the entirety of the pandemic, which should feel over for almost everybody now, including Democrats, as all these restrictions and mandates and whatnot are, are being lifted, kind of. I mean, still in schools, we're having tremendous amounts of, of problems in how we understand uh, that we're at some point here over here in the pandemic. And yet some people want us to be uh, back here. But anyway, the CDC is just uh, publishing very little, just giving only a tiny fraction uh, to those that uh, can make it public. And you got to ask the question, why? Uh, why is it that so much of this information needs to be kept a secret? The New York Times uh, reportedly highlighted that the criticism may shift to focus on the flip of that problem that the agency is a failing uh, to communicate with us. This is a Times report uh, that's actually uh, out as of this past weekend uh, and several other different valuable, I think, reactions uh, out there uh, to the CDC. It's just been sort of amazing to watch that, um, that organization, an organization that I think for a long time to a lot of people was uh, the type of place that would recommend the thing that was very hard for anyone to do the the idea like well you got to do this you got to do that and we're like all right uh, well we'll try our best cdc <laughs> and then uh, we have the pandemic we have the craziness and now they're a joke in social media now uh the cdc recommends is uh, humorous to a lot of young people to a lot of people um i, I think throughout the entirety of this whole thing and you got to ask yourself how that all occurred too uh why that organization and now it seems maybe to prevent it from getting any worse uh, they're just keeping this information to themselves. They're just deciding to to throw away and lock the uh, throw away the key, lock the door, or whatnot. Uh, and I thought that again, they were supposed to be out here for the good of all of us. Uh, I guess not not quite as much as they said. All right, I want to shift gears to something way more fun, at least for me. Uh, and there's two things I have here. Uh, the first one is a uh, Las Vegas Thai restaurant that might be selling THC tainted food. Uh, I don't know if they're doing this on purpose to make people more interested in their food or not. This is real, and here's some of the reaction to it. We've never had a problem before, but this was, this was a problem. I was like melting into my chair, and I got all disoriented and heavy, and I said to my husband, I said, I said honey, I, I think I'm high. And he was like, get out of here. We haven't left the house in two days. <laughs> You can't drug people. If they choose to do it on their own, no, you can't. that's their business. Right. But, you know, you can't mess with that stuff. You cannot. You cannot just decide to throw THC in your food and be like, yeah, it'll be great. Uh, and I just can't believe part of what she's saying. Uh, and it's not just the spiciness of the food, but the fact that, like, she was melting in her chair. This is bad. This We've is obviously bad. We've never had a bad. problem before. But this was, this was a problem. I was, like, melting into my chair. <laughs> that is a problem. After you're having a little bit of food, you had delivered, and you're like, wait a minute, a lot of things are not going the way uh, they should. There's also this. Um, I do like this as well, uh, this audio. I don't know um, why uh, this is the kind of decision that you'd make, uh, but in Jacksonville, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, they want to know why it smells so bad, and so they're investing in some sensors and some other things to figure out uh, what the smell situation is. Uh, I have my own theories, but let's hear from them. We have, at least based on the complaints, believe that some of the odor may be coming from pinene and styrene in the area, but we don't know what we don't know. And so that's what <laughs> these sensors are going to help us to see if there's maybe an unknown source or maybe there's a couple of sources masking others. Yeah, may, well, maybe there's an unknown source. Maybe there's something going on that we'll figure out with the sensors that we're... <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. I wonder if this pops up on the tourism uh, uh, sheet of things, like the little, uh, uh, you know, checkbox of these are reasons to hit up Jacksonville. 
Uh, help us figure out what the smell is. I feel like they should give away money at this point too, right? Like it shouldn't just be the sensors. That's not uh, the only way in which you figure this out. Just make it a, a chase. Make it some sort of um, treasure hunt. Send out as many people as want to do it. Make it a weekend uh, and have everybody look for whatever is causing the smell. Person who finds the smelliest thing, they win something. Uh, I love so many parts of that story and how they're, you know, they're a part of the solution, by the way. They're in on it. Uh, they know what's going on, and they're going to figure it all out uh, based on sensors uh, that tell them where the smell is. I want to hear that one more time. We have, at least based on the complaints, uh -huh. believe that some of the odor may be coming from pinene and styrene in the area, but we don't know what we don't know. We and do so not. that's what these sensors are going to help us to see if there's maybe an unknown source or maybe there's a couple of sources masking others. We're going to figure it out. We're, we're here for you. Uh, there's nothing better than that. I actually hope there's a bunch of news coverage, too. Um, news teams that are on your side and here to figure out from, from Jump what's going on. Uh, because I will play so, so much of it uh, the next time I'm in on this show. Uh, because I think it's just uh, the best. I, I, I don't know. I, I wonder if you live there, how you react to that. That the government is trying to set up sensors to figure out where the smells are coming from. Because nobody is sure. Uh, maybe you just like roll with it. Maybe like, yeah, that makes sense to us. Uh, we can't figure this out either. All right. One more thing I want to touch on outside of the fact that the uh, Winter Olympics were an absolute dud in the world of ratings. Um, I don't think uh, anywhere near as many people watch them as, as most even Winter Olympics, although Americans say they're more into summer uh, than winter games. Uh, but a couple things. The U.S. actually finished fifth in the medal count, which is not great. Uh, it doesn't feel great. Um, and maybe that's part of the apathy. Uh, that maybe we're just better at the summer than the winter games. Uh, but there's also uh, this. There was a Finland skier. <laughs> I don't know exactly how to navigate this on the show, but we're going to try. Uh, who suffered from a frozen situation, uh, a frozen body part thing, twice in a, in a long skiing race. This was a cross-country race. Um, a part of the male body that if most of us had any sort of injury at, we would give up the sport we were in. A hot, we would just 100% walk away. But this guy had two issues in which uh, frozen is one of the words to describe the issue. Uh, heat packs were used to thaw out any of the, the harmed, um, <laughs> harmed parts of the body. And the guy kept going. He kept skiing. I think he finished 28th out of a possible 61 racers. Uh, but when Remy Lindholm, is his name from Finland, suffered the thing he suffered... It made me feel so different about all the sporting events I've seen, say Michael Jordan's flu game and all the way in which athletes sort of uh, come to rise to the occasion. Uh, no matter what the issue is, uh, they sort of, you know, find a way uh, to get through, find a way to, to fight all the, the pain they might be uh, experiencing. This gentleman uh, has now had the most, since, the most epic, uh, the most significant version of a flu game that I've ever heard about. Uh, but apparently this is kind of an issue uh, in that sport. Men's cross-country skiing, uh, if it gets too cold, deals with some unique challenges. And most of us, I think, and I, whole, I feel like I'm speaking for the whole of, of uh, the male population, uh, would quit the sport. We would just walk away. We'd be done. No one would question us. There would be no press conference demanding that you change your mind. You're giving a better explanation as to why you're done. Uh, once you describe what the problem is, most guys would be like, yeah, it's fine. You should be, they should just destroy the sport it should go away completely uh, at least that's how i feel about it i wonder if if you feel differently and i'll move on because i'm sure people would like me to stop uh, talking about a story that very uh, much to my uh, juvenile uh, levels of of interest it it amused me quite a bit today all right a quick break a lot more uh, craig collins filling in on the chad benson show Check out our Chad Benson Show Facebook page where you can hang out or hang your grievances out to dry. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to have you with us. So, so much to talk about. And yet one thing I saw that I couldn't get over that I thought was rather interesting was just how much money a water boy makes in the NFL. Uh, look, I'm not going to, uh, you know, belittle anybody or take away anybody from the amount of money they can make at whatever it is they do for a living. Uh, but this is interesting. The fact that a water boy makes about $53,000 a year, uh, I feel like this is a side gig a lot of us could handle. Uh, a lot of people out there 
could pick this up on the weekend, uh, figure it out, and uh, be better off for it, I would say. Uh, but this is a former NFL player, Jake Thieneman, uh, talking about this, and I just thought it was so interesting how significant it was. How much do NFL Waterboys get paid? So NFL Waterboys make, on average, $53,000 per year, plus other perks like gear, travel, and getting to hang out with players. Now, there's a misconception that these people just hand out water and towels, and while that's what you see on game day, that's not the whole truth. These are trainers on the athletic training staff. Most of them have athletic training degrees or PT degrees, and they're learning the craft of treating players' injuries and helping guys stay healthy. They tape guys up, provide other treatments before and after games, and throughout the week. So look at this more as an apprenticeship to learn the craft instead of just squirting water bottles. That's totally fine. I, I get what you're saying there, that it's more than just squirting a water bottle and that people are learning to do a lot more with it. I could learn. I, I think a lot of us would learn. A lot of people for uh, $53,000, if uh, most of what you got to do is show up on weekends and squirt the water bottle, I uh, could get that done. But I, that's something that went viral on social media uh, just because of exactly how much money it is. Uh, there's also this, uh, if I'm just talking about the world of sports for a quick second here, uh, LeBron James showed up to the All-Star game with a tequila satchel on. Uh, and this is <laughs> an interesting move, I think, for a lot of us to make. I don't think I would make this move. Uh, he has his own brand of tequila, as does just about everybody uh, nowadays. It seems like a thing that... Uh, you got to be, oh, not tequila specifically, but you got to be in on something other than whatever your main uh, source of income is. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting the way in which even uh, they talked about it. They they watched him walk in. Uh, this is with the suit jacket on, the, you know, nice dress, all that stuff. And they tequila around his waist satchel. And uh, it's just, as I said, um, and I think they actually kind of praised him in a couple of the uh, places that I saw this reaction and actually on the, a uh, television broadcast as well, uh, saying that it was a a fashionable move, uh, but it just it I don't think it's one that you're going to see a lot of people rocking anytime soon. Uh, that's just me. I, I'm just speaking for myself here. Uh, maybe you're the kind of person that loves this sort of thing, and I'm trying to pull up this audio, but I'm having a bit of a a technical issue with it. But it, it's just to me uh, fantastic that you have LeBron James uh, deciding to uh, promote a product in the most extreme of ways. When do they just start wearing, like, patches on their coats of all the things that they're actually sponsoring? When do we get to that world of, yeah, it's totally fine. We're taking this a step further uh, now, and uh, we don't just want to wear the products on us. Or maybe you just do that. Maybe you just wear more and more of them. Um, You're just covered in as many products as possible. I don't know. Uh, But I think that that's probably the next move. If it's not, we'll get to that audio later. Uh, But it is, it's fun. Uh, LeBron James being like, what is he wearing? Oh, yeah, it's his uh, brand of tequila. Uh, There's also this. I just want to move on to some other things I saw uh, that are more fun in the news, at least for me, uh, hopefully for others out there. Um, Although this one confusing. And uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it when I filled in for Chad before, but I have a brand new pet. We have a new puppy. It's our first puppy for our family, um, which has been a lot of fun, but a lot of challenge. There's been a lot of issues with it. Uh, But there's this story that people would rather give a massage to their pet than their partner. And uh, I'm at a loss. I don't even know how you'd explain that to the person you're in a relationship with if this is true. Uh, But this is real. Uh, People were asked for the uh, top things they enjoy doing uh, with their pet. And then some of the things they compared to whether or not they enjoyed them quite as much uh, doing them with a a loved one. And uh, uh, on the list, very high up on the list, things they like doing in general with a pet and probably more so than with their partner, or going for a run or a walk, cuddling on the sofa or couch, taking a nap, uh, taking the pet to work. Uh, they do their gardening, apparently, together. Some people do. I uh, go to the beach and give them a massage. As I said, number seven on the list of something that people said would be more fun to do. Um, how? Why? When? Uh, you know, honestly... I feel like a lot of people joke about that the current uh, generation, and I'm a millennial, by the way, so this is self-hate, I guess, on the younger of us, Gen Z and myself, uh, have difficulties interacting uh, because you're raised in social media, uh, more that generation than my own, or at least me personally. I remember a time when Facebook wasn't a thing, and I remember it gloriously. Uh, But because of all the different things we have now, uh, we're getting worse and worse at being in person in the moment. Uh, They actually... Uh, say that it's very difficult for someone of the younger generation to hit on, flirt with, pick up anybody that they see in public. You'd much rather do it in private uh, via the Internet, uh, which is probably its own challenge uh, for how we look in a dating world. But then you have this. 
then you have the likelihood that people would rather, at least according to the survey, and actually I worked with one guy, he's one of my favorite people I've worked with in radio, uh, that said that surveys are always wrong because it's always survey people who fill them out. Uh, survey people are ones that when you get asked a question, like on a street corner or something, uh, or you don't know where it's coming from, you just answer. You just provide the answer right away. And we're all not built like that. I don't know that that's a perfect um, description of how people create uh, these surveys nowadays, but I like the idea uh, that all surveys are flawed because it's really just people who love answering them. Uh, but again, if you want to have a photo shoot, go on a vacation, go to the beach, do gardening, all of these things, more with a pet than a loved one, uh, a pet than a spouse, uh, we have an issue. We have an issue that needs addressing, uh, that needs fixing ASAP as soon as possible uh, because definitely this is not the kind of thing that I think helps us at all. Uh, one last one on this list at number 10 uh, some people actually prefer to cook with their pet more so than their partner. This is the only one I can understand because I'm a terrible, terrible cook. And I would guess uh, that my puppy and I have about equal ability there. All right. Uh, this is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. More coming up in a bit. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts independent life this is chad benson this is the chad benson show my name is craig collins filling in thrilled to have you with us a hundred vehicles were towed in ottawa uh to clear out the last of the remaining canadian freedom convoy protesters now granted this is not the last of the protesters uh protest after protest has now popped up uh throughout canada uh people just walking through the streets uh asking for their basic freedoms uh, police had arrested 47 of the remaining COVID-19 protesters in Ottawa, I think, over the weekend. Uh, what I think is so interesting, at least 100 were arrested in a crackdown over the, I think, uh, a few day period where police decided to get much more uh, serious about uh, stopping uh, a peaceful protest. Um, but there's there's a couple of valuable points. Uh, the first one is that truckers are the best equipped to do something significant in the world of protesting, I think. Uh, they're the most valuable group in our country that would know how few of them would be needed to shut down any one specific area or, say, a supply chain route in order to cause a lot of issues. Uh, so really, the first problem for Canada is that they refuse to work with a group of individuals who would have been acutely aware of causing valuable, valuable disruption uh, in a way that I think a lot of people throughout the history of our country and others would be very proud in the world of protesters asking for uh, freedom, asking for the ability to choose between mask and vaccine mandates and whatnot. Uh, as again, more and more data seems to indicate how stupid it would be to continue to have those things in any capacity. And yet here we are in a world where Canada, uh, a country that I think a lot of us joke about of uh, for being a very, very nice is being very, very not nice uh, to a lot of individuals. And uh, as I said, there's going to be more and more of these protests popping up. Case in point is this, though. Uh, there is a capital fence that's going to be going up before Biden's State of the Union as truckers plan a D.C. protest. Uh, because, one, what may have happened in Canada may have demonstrated to a lot of people that this is something we can do. This is something that can work. And I've said time and again, as I've watched this whole Freedom Convoy thing play out, how, um, you know, horrible it looked and how the images and everything about it was just so disturbing and how I guess the one piece of solace we might take in a situation like this is our country never got to the point uh, to round up this many uh, people, this many innocent individuals, uh, peaceful protesters, uh, the way that we're seeing in Canada. And yet maybe it's coming, and I don't know what the the scenario exactly will be or what the reaction will be uh, in Canada. As I said, their pol politicians are going uh, crazy about it. Uh, and it looks like a lot of everyday people are now rising up to at least uh, take part in some of these additional marches. 
Um, because, and honestly, I've also said this from jump, every part of the conversation we've been having every single time that someone you knew in your life, and I'm not anti-vaccine, I'm not anti uh, any of that stuff personally. I am anti-mandate as so many are, uh, but anyone you might know who tried to, to tell you that they didn't want the government to reach too far, uh, to do too much, and that's the reason uh, more so than any specific uh, dislike of, say, a mask or whatnot or a vaccine, uh, but it was really just demonstrating uh, that that was uh, government overreach. This is why people did that, to not get to the point uh, where you're seeing the mass roundups like we're seeing here and the enacting of Freedoms Acts and whatnot, uh, emergency acts, excuse me, uh, that give the government a ridiculous amount of power in Canada. And certainly, again, in the United States, this is something that should absolutely uh, disturb us if we see in any shape or form, as we're again hearing that there's going to be truckers protesting at the State of Union. And, and again, uh, this is just me from a strategic standpoint. This is just me saying uh, if I were in any of these rooms with anybody kind of deciding what moves to make and not to make, one of the first groups of people I would bring up to make sure that they're on uh, good terms with us would be truckers uh, for several reasons, for the valuable thing, uh, uh, the valuable service they supply uh, to our society now that so many people buy pretty much everything you want online. Uh, I think you pretty much purchase most of the things uh, a lot of Americans do. I know I'm being uh, uh, hyperbolic when I say that, but uh, that's obviously important and just protesting in that way, stopping those deliveries and not just disrupting the supply chains would have a serious impact too. Uh, so here we are. We're in a situation where you're looking at uh, story after story of things that you thought would never occur, uh, honestly, in places like Canada or here in the United States. And I think there's a chance that, unfortunately, we see that in in both. All right. I want to move on. Other things in the news, uh, something I want to keep playing as far as uh, just a surprising reaction I saw. Uh, this is Jake Sullivan talking on today. Uh, he is talking about whether or not uh, we see any sort of... Um, invasion one from uh, Russia of Ukraine, and then whether or not it just it stops there. These are real questions being asked. And of course, anyone that feels uh, that this story is just overblown and being politicized, I get it. I get every uh, bit of distrust here. Uh, but what's more interesting to me is that if you're someone uh, like Jake Sullivan, a, a political advisor, uh, someone important to this, this administration, uh, that what you'd say as a national security advisor is, is we will do everything we can uh, to stop uh, Russian aggression after uh, Ukraine is already a place that they've uh, invaded successfully. Uh, it's interesting that we keep talking about the after, and I actually have audio of the vice president doing it too, uh, but here's Jake. What leads you to believe that they're going to stop at Ukraine? Well, the most important thing that the president has done uh, with respect to deterrence has been to send thousands of American service members to Poland and Romania and to work with other allies to send forces to NATO allies along NATO's east, uh, the areas that border Ukraine or border Russia. So he has been absolutely clear, the president, that we will defend every inch of NATO territory because we have an Article 5 commitment to do so, and that is a sacred obligation. And if Russia chooses to move against any NATO country, come further west into NATO territory, they will be met with the full force of American and allied might. This should never get to that, that place. It should never get there. Uh, and honestly, again, and actually the question's been asked a few times uh, of several of the administration representatives who are out there, like John Kirby and Jake Sullivan, uh, why didn't this happen with the last administration in power? And their answer is ask Putin. Uh, they don't know why. We know why. We believe we know why these these uh, sets of tensions are now rising at a, at a ridiculous rate. Uh, here is the vice president uh, giving a fumbled, broken question, broken answer to a question about what happens uh, if Putin invades uh, and whether or not they believe whether uh, that is is likely uh, going to whatever occur. Uh, again, the answers uh, would not make you, if you're someone uh, in power in a foreign country, uh, willing to be provocative and or actually uh, use military force, not against us, uh, as I said, but in Russia's case against Ukraine. When you hear answers like this, you probably feel even better about your likelihood of of making that decision against this administration. Can you explain to Americans what exactly will they face if, well, if this happens? Sure. As the president talked about in his speech, um, we are aware that, again, when America stands for her principles, 
and all of the things that we hold dear. Um, it requires sometimes for, for us to put ourselves out there in a way that maybe we will incur some cost. And in this what? situation, what? Um, that may relate to energy costs, for example. But we are taking very specific and appropriate, I believe, steps to mitigate what that cost might be. Uh, yeah, I don't think you're doing that at all. I think that's something that's definitely not at all occurring in any way, shape, or form. And again, just to, to uh, play it back as best I can, uh, the Americans, uh, uh, what we stand for, what our principles are that we hold dear, um, you can almost hear fear in her voice. And if you're leaders who are fearful of escalating tensions or whatnot, uh, you certainly don't demonstrate to the other, the opponent, to the other side of, of whatever the conflict might be, uh, that we're a valuable force to be right. And we are. Like, that's the funniest part about the way in which, and funny might be an odd word to choose, uh, but it's that or, or cry. Uh, we're, we're such a valuable uh, deterrent just in what we have, uh, who we are as a country and a military, that the fact that this administration can't wield that correctly is mind-boggling. When America stands for her principles and all of the things that we hold dear, uh -huh. um, it requires sometimes for, for us to put ourselves out there in a way that maybe we will incur some cost. And in this that that's fear. This, she's uh, gasping for breath. She's uh, navigating these answers in a way that's just not at all uh, what you'd expect from someone in charge of a military like ours. Uh, and again, I'm not asking for actual military strikes here. I'm not asking the United States to uh, to give American lives and to to uh, bull rush themselves into the the fight uh, per se. Uh, but it, it just it's the same as any other of the challenges that has been thrown at those in charge right now. Uh, whether it's inflation and a lack of actual response there, gas prices, and how the uh, press secretary all the time talks about the 10-cent reduction that occurred uh, at some point in late December, early January because of reserves that were released and then immediately went away as if that was doing enough. Um, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I will take a break after saying it this time. Uh, but the truth is that this administration, even with the words they use, uh, don't convince many uh, that they have the might, they have the resolve, whatever you want to call it, to back up those words. And obviously, when the uh, when the time comes, they've yet to back up the words on any occasion. Uh, so it scares me tremendously. And on that note, I'll take a break and promise to talk about other things after this. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. Me too. Hashtag immigration reforms. Hashtag help. I'm trapped in a hashtag factory and I can't get out. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Uh, my name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad is back tomorrow. Lots and lots to talk about. Lots and lots out there in the news. Uh, Jen Psaki, one of the many people that talked, I think, over the weekend about whether or not uh, things will happen between uh, Russia and Ukraine and how uh, the United States will respond, uh, provided Russia does nothing. Uh, Jen Psaki was one of the first, I think, to say, the White House press secretary, uh, that, Pi uh, that Biden, excuse me, uh, our President Joe Biden, uh, would sit down with Vladimir Putin. I just turned them into a, a name together. I just made them Biden, which I don't think would make anyone happy, uh, but sit down for some sort of summit. Uh, whether or not you'd feel good about that or I'd feel good about that is something that we're yet to see. I want to talk about uh, an issue I've seen a lot, and I don't mean this uh, as silly as maybe it's going to come out because I am legitimately at times uh, kind of worried about this. Uh, but everybody just seems very mad. Um, well, not everybody, uh, but a lot of people out there seem uh, to be mad. It seems like the tolerance for stress, uh, whether it's been because you've hated the way uh, that so much has been handled over the last few years, or maybe there's a lot of people out there now who struggle with the changes that are happening and whether or not they're ready for those changes. Joy Behar, I think last week, said that she was going to wear a mask forever. Uh, just keep it on, uh, not take it off uh, whenever she goes out for the near future, because why not? Uh, it makes sense to her now. Uh, but because of all this, I think that we're, we're uniquely challenged uh, right now at, at navigating maybe conflict as it arises uh, in our everyday lives between other people, whoever they are, uh, for whatever reason. Case in point is a Walmart employee in Massachusetts that stabbed a coworker. Uh, this was last week over spilled milk, and I mean that literally. 
Uh, they were arrested and charged. The other guy was hospitalized but should be fine. Uh, a 23-year-old Massachusetts per, uh, a man named Omar uh, Robles uh, was arrested for stabbing another man at 5 a.m. Uh, last Thursday morning. Uh, Omar and the victim were working a graveyard shift. Uh, they had a break when apparently some milk got spilled, uh, which created an argument. Omar is a janitor. Uh, during said argument, he took out a knife and stabbed another person. I mean, what are we doing? I, I, I laugh as I say that, too, because I can't, I can't fathom uh, how to get back from some of this stuff. And, you know, actually, I want to say this. I'm just going to get up on the soapbox for a second. Please forgive me. I apologize. Uh, but I'm here for a reason, and I like it. And so this is what I'm going to do with it. Um, but I think that so many times whenever you have this conversation with, say, a friend, say you see this story, uh, you talk about how people seem to be angrier than they've been before, and the friend will tell you that it's political divide, uh, that it's politicians separating us. They're uh, the biggest problem in our society, and they have to be stopped. And while I agree uh, that rhetoric and all the things that occur in the world of politics, if you listen to them all the time, if you obsess about them, can probably drive you insane uh, like this person might be. Uh, I don't think that that's at the real heart, the true issue uh, for any of our problems. I, I think the the real reason uh, that you see smash and grab uh, crimes being committed, you see so many of these um, individuals, uh, for, for lack of a better word, deciding to just go nuts in whatever term, is because of so many of the other issues we just can't talk about anymore as a society. Uh, I feel like if you're playing by the rules of, say, the woke culture, if you're playing by the rules created by social media uh, more than the real world, uh, then you might walk about most of your your day-to-day -day life uh, feeling like you can't have many conversations, feeling like you can't address anything uh, going on uh, that might be even a remotely bit controversial uh, to someone else. Uh, whether it actually is controversial is yet to be determined. And so this is what we have. We have people that are, are I think, um, being uh, contained in every way possible, being uh, pushed into, and I'm not going to blame people who do bad things are, aren't truly just a victim. Uh, they've chosen to go ahead and make that additional step uh, to do what most of us don't do. I've never stabbed over anybody over spilled milk. I don't intend to. Uh, but I think that that, that suppression, that, that pushing down of ideology, of the things that we want to talk about, the way in which we want to uh, behave as, as humans is really causing a lot of the anger. And as we're talking about things like additional protests, uh, trucker protests here in our country, the Freedom Convoy and what's happening to those protesters in Canada, uh, you do wonder if that's just going to continue to perpetuate the problem, uh, that at some point, maybe what truly needs to go away, uh, more so than the, the screaming matches that occur in the world of politics, and I'm not for them. I'm just saying they're, they're their own unique issue. But what really needs to go away is this, this restricting or this, uh, this attempt to restrict everybody from their own opinions. I mean, case in point is the pandemic. If there were anything that ever would have uh, happened, ever would have occurred in a society that was already as challenged as it was from handling the opinions of people you disagree with, it's a, a worldwide health pandemic. And it created the exact outcome I think a lot of us could have predicted. If you can't have a conversation about whether or not this is funny, that is funny, uh, whether or not you can say this, you can't say that, whether brands and companies or, or say, it's sporting uh, leagues uh, need to have an opinion on the issues of the day, all things we used to navigate much easier uh, back when, that that pushes us to this boiling pot we've gotten to now. So maybe woke culture needs to go is what I'm saying, and I'm sure you agree. Quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. The Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad is back tomorrow. 
Uh, when a former DNC chair sums up the Biden administration in the terms I'm about to play, uh, you know that the problem is now something all recognized. It's not just something that's fun for uh, those on the opposite side of the aisle to shoot at. And honestly, uh, when things get as bad as they do, uh, like they are right now, it's not really fun. Uh, to be honest, it's not uh, the kind of thing you want to do uh, all day, every day when you do what I do. Just crap on an administration that's as flawed as they are. Uh, but here is that DNC chair, former chair, uh, as I said, summing up on ABC this week, uh, just how bad things have gotten. So, Donna, the president is just over a week away from his State of the Union address. He faces the very real possibility of going into that speech against the backdrop of a war in Europe, economic anxiety at home and a clear, decisive majority disapproving or unhappy with his performance as president. How does he turn it around? <laughs> By the way. The fact that that's the question to start is a uh, rough. I can't imagine anybody, even if they love, which as uh, does just stated there, is very few people. Uh, the the work being done by the administration before this uh, this uh, upcoming uh, State of the Union uh, that you wonder exactly what possibly could have been said. But here's the answer. Well, first of all, tone matter, and I think what the president should do is talk to the American people, just like you and I are sitting here talking. You and I have had, you know. We've broken bread. Talk to the American people. They want to know about the challenges that we're facing. They want to hear what he's doing. I mean, inflation is robbing up, robbing us of our joy, stealing yes. our hard-earned wages. Correct. I can't go to the grocery store without complaining about the price of eggs and bacon. I mean, a pound of bacon is almost nine dollars. Jesus. I mean, <laughs> that's it for me and bacon. I never thought I would give it up. Me neither. But the point is, is that he has to talk about COVID. Yeah, we're tired of COVID, but COVID is not tired of us. He has to talk about crime. We don't want to, you know, have a country that people running around with guns. We don't want to have a country where people are running around with guns. Uh, we do not. Uh, you've got to talk about issue after issue. I mean, bacon alone feels like the best way to start that conversation. That that reaches across the aisle. If you talk about how the price of bacon being $9, as Donna mentioned there, uh, and how inappropriate that is and how we're going to fix that, uh, honestly, it's the only stimulus I might get behind. If it's free bacon for everybody, if everybody gets a slab of bacon instead of the masks we don't need anymore, instead of the things that they're sending us out, the test kits uh, that are not valuable that they want to give to Americans, just send us some nice packaged free bacon, and I feel like you're on the right path. Maybe if I ever run for a political office, that's the road I'll take, is bacon first and bacon pretty much all the time. Uh, and I'm kidding, of course, as I say that, but that is that's devastating. In the assessment there, and uh, Joe, uh, who will whisper, he'll be uh, very strange at times throughout any sort of statement he makes to talk to the American people. Uh, that's his version of being a human, of being someone that's not a politician uh, and someone who then acts in every way, shape or form, including just not answering questions and running away from the media uh, the way in which he does. But all of those things um, are, are just tremendously valuable to hear from the side that's supposed to be supporting him. Uh, from the individuals that are supposed to be happy with the job performance. And honestly, you don't even really know uh, what would be the next idea in the Democratic Party right now. You, I don't see any rising stars the way you see DeSantis or Tim Scott, the way you see these individuals uh, gaining momentum, gaining value. Uh, the only individuals I guess we talk about a lot in the world of the Democratic Party are the ones that are so very, very far to the left. They truly make things worse. Uh, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, people like Bernie Sanders uh, that are so very far, uh, even more so than Joe, uh, who is obviously listening to those individuals and certainly not, it seems, uh, making any of the decisions on his own, uh, that maybe the party only goes further in a certain direction. After you see recalling of teachers in San Francisco and and all these uh, demonstrations of the way in which the talking points were wrong, I, when we talk about police funding, uh, which is something I mentioned from time to time, uh, how valuable it is now to see how many Americans support the idea of more police funding, of, of valuable uh, reinforcements provided to secure our communities after all the rises in crime. Uh, there's nothing better uh, than squashing down on a terrible idea than when a reality sets in uh, after you start to go the way we know we shouldn't go. All right, other news, uh, something that probably should uh, be talked about more than it is. I'm not going to misrepresent this. 
uh, any more than anyone else will, I guess. I- I'm going to tell you there's challenges uh, to how much of this report is is valuable, uh, what the exact information uh, that Hillary Clinton and the IT people she employed were trying to gain uh, from former President Donald Trump uh, when he was in a, a individual, a citizen, and not a president when he was in the White House. Uh, but the fact remains, the Durham re- report, the Durham filing, does contend that Hillary Clinton did spy uh, via technology, uh, via certain Internet things, uh, certain uh, tech ways on our former president during and before he was in the White House. That is a simple sentence that even the places like the New York Times, who tell you all this is overblown and imagined and a conservative thing, uh, will admit that, yeah, okay, there was some spying. The degree of spying and how important it is is the thing we're all really arguing, I guess, Uh, But here is Ted Cruz uh, talking about how valuable it is uh, as far as the report itself goes and how big of a deal it should be. And he compares it to Watergate, uh, something that was botched and failed on its own. Uh, So truthfully, there is a tremendously valuable comparison here uh, to something that caused a lot of people to lose their jobs uh, last time, a lot of people to get in quite a bit of trouble. Uh, Watergate, one of the biggest political scandals uh, most Americans can name. And yet the Durham filing is something that's being belittled yet again. Uh, Like so many of these uh, talking points of the former president, so many of these issues uh, that were pointed to uh, that were ignored. Another great example of this for anyone who's skeptical is the idea that the lab leak theory uh, that a Chinese lab created COVID was mocked, ridiculed, and even censored on social media for a while just because former President Trump threw that idea out there early on in the process when not a lot of others would. And yet now it's something that most scientists, including Dr. Fauci, admit is a possibility, at the very least a possibility. Uh, That's a tremendous turnaround. Will this happen again uh, with this Durham filing? I don't know. Uh, But it just seems to me that the media bashing and so much of the media attacking the validity of this, we've seen this before. Allegations, what Durham filed in, in, in a filing in federal court is deeply concerning. What, what Durham alleged as a federal prosecutor, as a special prosecutor, is that a lawyer for the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, conspired with a big tech executive to monitor and spy on Donald Trump, to spy on him at his home, to spy on him at his office. And, and indeed, they were spying on the White House itself. They were spying on a sitting president. That, that, that is, you, you know, you and I both remember when, when President Trump said the Democrats are spying on me and, and the corporate media collectively laughed at him. They mocked at him. They, 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 they said, what a ridiculous claim for him to make. Well, if what, what special counsel Durham is alleging is true, that what, what Donald Trump said was absolutely right. And, and to the extent Hillary Clinton is complicit with this, her campaign is complicit with it, her lawyers are complicit with it, big tech is complicit with it. If this is true, it's a lot bigger than Watergate. That was a bungled third rate burglary. It was wrong. People went to jail for Watergate and people need to go to jail for this if these allegations are okay. true. Just think about that again one more time. Uh, the way in which this is discussed, the way in which we articulate and think about the issues of the day uh, involving this specific report. If you're in most of media right now, uh, you ridicule any aspect of it as having any value whatsoever, even the talk shows, uh, which are certainly not any sort of valuable news media, uh, who are, um, for the most part, very uh, anti-former President Trump, very clearly so, uh, ridiculed every part of this as just a conservative obsession. Um, But even if the things that were being spied on even if they're described the way they are in some uh, platforms uh, accurately, and that's still yet to be seen, uh, the amount of information still uh, uh, coming fro- forward is, is you know, not the totality. It's We don't have everything that we need on this story quite yet, uh, so we will need more over time. Uh, but as we gain these sort of things, to dismiss spying because it's not really uh, the biggest kind of spying, this is how I saw it in the New York Times. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll just make it a little bit more clear. Uh, some of the things they said are that you couldn't track exactly what was being written. You couldn't read the emails. You couldn't read the uh, the text messages. You could just track some of the activity as far as where things were going. If, if certain devices uh, from certain people were connecting 
uh, say, to Internet inside Trump Tower and whatnot. Uh, these were some of the things that even the New York Times admitted uh, were spying allegations that were true, uh, that were accurate. And I don't know all the details. I don't have all the definitive information, as I think most of us don't, as to what the totality of information uh, that was trying to or that was gained uh, by a, a uh, presidential candidate against her opponent and then against someone in office. But the fact that we're not arguing all of that, the fact that we're seeding some of this is accurate and true and just the degree to which the spying occurred is the moment of defense or the moment of uh, it's not as big of a deal as we think it is, is truly telling and tremendously awful, uh, to say the very least, uh, that that is the version of, no, they're crazy on their side of the aisle because this spying is okay spying. is just something I didn't think I'd see. And yet again, uh, yet another version of this obsession that the hatred for a former politician, a former president, a uh, person who carried himself a certain way is so great that so many things are ignored, forgiven, written off, uh, whatever the word might be, uh, compared to if anyone else said them. I honestly think that that's uniquely true of both sides of the aisle. If anyone else uh, dealt with the kind of things that our former president dealt with throughout his time in office, uh, they would be met with a degree of, of understanding, a degree of something, uh, some sort of empathy as opposed to apathy, uh, by most of the media that seems to so truly hate this man uh, that when they talk about him, and honestly, there's even this thing out there on Axios about how terrible it is for uh, conservative, for, excuse me, for liberals right now, for Democrats, uh, to keep trashing the former president in every conversation they have, in every single uh, political statement they make or, or however they navigate challenging issues, blame the uh, COVID pandemic and then blame the former president. When you're doing just those two things so consistently, most Americans are saying they're sick of it now. They're bored with that. They need you to move on. They need you to find uh, better avenues to conversation. And this still is an example of, of a way in which uh, that obsession seems to not be gone. The Trump derangement syndrome uh, seems to still very much exist uh, as much as it possibly can for someone who's currently not in any office. Uh, a quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on The Chad Benson Show. Being antisocial sucks. Hang with Chad's friends on Facebook, The Chad Benson Show. And if you just need some alone time, head on over to Twitter at Chad Benson Show. Either way, we can't wait to meet the real you. This is The Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Thrilled to have you with us. Lots and lots of stuff to talk about. Chad is back tomorrow. Uh, I saw this story, and I wonder if you're someone uh, like me who makes bad food decisions sometimes, uh, whether it's in the morning or uh, late at night. Uh, but apparently there's a bunch of foods you should avoid right before bedtime because uh, these foods might cause a lot of problems uh, if you eat them in excess uh, or, I guess, just eat them at all, uh, some of them, before uh, going to bed. It's not surprising uh, that most of them are fried, fatty, high-carb, sugar foods. Uh, these are things that like, say, Oreos and milk uh, you might enjoy to eat. Uh, they can cause all kinds of indigestion, heartburn, acid reflux, and slowing down one metabolism uh, issues that might add to any kind of thing you have uh, as far as uh, any kind of challenges there. And they also actually uh, limit your productivity, apparently. If you get a bad night's sleep or if you have uh, some other things that go on, uh, then, of course, you wake up the next morning and you're struggling even more than that. Uh, so these are things that people are saying, the experts are saying to avoid uh, once again, I love this advice, though, in these worlds and the way in which it's given, because this is stuff that's not new, stuff we see all the time and stuff where a lot of doctors tell you how to live your life uh, the way that they think you should. And then a lot of us don't don't do it. And yet no one really goes crazy. No one really cares. Uh, it's just a part of the everyday life we all live. And I wonder why we couldn't have applied that to some other scenarios uh, that we've all recently lived through. But yet that is the world we live in now. Uh, so why uh, belabor that point any more than that? I also saw this story, something that I couldn't get over and something that I thought was interesting uh, just because of the way it's articulated. Uh, this is in the New York Post. Uh, I think this is uh, a writing to uh, someone looking for advice, one of those advice columns. And here's what it says. Here's the, uh, the question. 
I'm a 64-year-old man, and I have been with my current employer for nine years. I had to do some life setbacks. can't retire yet. He's been in the industry for 15 years, so he's very knowledgeable and competent. Uh, he despises his workplace, though, in the drama, uh, but he works with a group of women who have a lot of turmoil in their lives, and it spills out into the workplace. This is a 64-year-old man talking. Don't shoot me. I'm the messenger. Don't unwoke me. Uh, their daily conduct is, quote, this is all in the question, catty, juvenile, with disregard for per, uh, proper business modicum, um, uh, just uh, proper business uh, um, behavior. Uh, do I tough it out or look for somewhere else to work? Uh, that is the question. Uh, and then the answer, uh, which I thought was pretty entertaining, uh, talks about sex in the city, the office, all the scenarios that exist uh, in the uh, fake versions of workplaces and whether or not uh, those are uh, the typical things you're dealing with. And without getting too specific uh, to a situation I'm not in, I find this to probably be a challenge for a lot of people uh, that you feel maybe if you're someone of a different generation and you're working with a lot of younger people, not specifically women, uh, but just younger people in general, uh, the types of things people fight about in the workplace now are probably not the things uh, that were getting fought about back in the day. Uh, these are probably not the same concerns uh, that people have. I will tell you this, just a quick personal story. Uh, there was once an occurrence uh, where I was asked to have a conversation with a few other people. I wasn't alone in having this conversation. There were a few that needed to have it uh, because a, a member of a workplace uh, felt that they weren't well-liked, that no one wanted to be their friend. And I think I was on the, the outside of most of the conversation. I don't think I was someone that needed to be too involved, uh, but I was just sitting there. And, well, I, I tried as best I could to hear all of it kindly and do things to make people happy. I kept wondering to myself when it became valuable to, to give that sort of argument in a workplace, when us not being friends, uh, me or a group of people, uh, is something that matters at all. I, no one was being unprofessional. No one was, was being mean. Uh, that was the part that I, I liked even more, uh, again, as I tried my best to understand the complaint. And in this uh, um, self-help writing, this 64-year-old man uh, saying that they also feel as though the workplace drama is just inappropriate in the office space. It's, it's just that version of expectation now of maybe living a life in which you feel as though uh, you have to walk into every single room as if it's your Facebook page, your social media page, and you have to constantly be getting likes and follows and comments on all the things you do. And if you don't get that, well, then you're mad at everybody and you want to make sure everybody understands. It wasn't, by the way, HR who brought anyone into the room in that story I'm telling, because I don't think any company would try that. It was just an employer who was like, hey, this is a complaint we've got. What can we do to fix it? And I was like, I don't know, be more professional, maybe everybody. All right, quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is real. There's a level of anxiety that I haven't seen since the 1970s. And and I'd be curious to your reaction. Joe Biden ran as Harry Truman. He thought he was going to govern as Franklin Roosevelt. But this to me looks just like Jimmy Carter in every possible way. And those people sitting in the chamber on the 1st of March are going to wonder from this president, is he going to do to them what Jimmy Carter did, which is give us Ronald Reagan? Is he going to do to them what Bill Clinton did, which was he gave us... Well, to, to, to take the Carter analogy one step further, I mean, if you look at Axelrod's advice, lean into the anxiety, humility. I mean, he's basically advising him to give a Malay speech. No. Uh, that is both... Uh, by the way, this is Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Uh, that is both Frank Luntz and uh, Jonathan Carl, uh, ABC News, of course, uh, John Carl. Uh, talking about the Biden administration and the upcoming State of the Union. Uh, what I think is so interesting about a lot of this, the way in which those conversations are going and these 
uh, pollsters, these political advisors are cutting through a lot of this to see the truth for what it is uh, right now is exactly that, is that I believe, as many do, uh, that the failures of this current administration are so significant, so um, tremendous. And as we're now talking about the potential for more protesting, for trucker protests here in our country after what we've seen happen in Canada and the Freedom Convoy mass arrested over the last few days, hundreds of arrests, towing of of uh, cars, towing of, of trucks and whatnot, and just a, a tremendous amount of ugliness uh, of images of, of cops. They stampeded a woman. And I know that a lot of the police officers probably didn't want to do uh, what they're doing now, the way in which they're breaking up these peaceful uh, protests, these disruptive protests, these effective uh, protests in Canada, and whether we start to see things like that uh, here in the United States. Um, but the side of the aisle that should be defending, that should be standing with the president on a lot of the issues that are maybe making so many Americans frustrated uh, seem to not be the plan. That seems to not be the way to move forward uh, for so many and that uh, the Jimmy Carter example, the Jimmy Carter uh, comparisons get stronger and stronger all the time. I We will see uh, what occurs. We will see how this goes. To take what Frank said one step further, though, uh, in a different way, I guess, um, former President Donald Trump was tremendously successful back in 2016, changing the way that politicians talked and spoke, uh, certainly upsetting a lot of people uh, along the way. I'm not necessarily... Uh, having a reaction to that. I'm just saying it's a thing uh, that occurred. And yet now, uh, going up to, I'm sure, the midterm elections going the way in which so many believe they'll go, uh, but then a presidential election just a couple years after that, uh, you can't help but think that most of the talking points are in the corner of uh, Republicans in the corner of the former president. That's just what's occurred uh, when the uh, way in which this administration has handled itself has been so tremendously, tremendously bad And their focus, in my mind, has been on saying the right things, saying the right words all the time uh, to appease those on the far side of their political aisle and then having very little action uh, to back any of that up. I want to play this audio of the vice president, Kamala Harris, uh, talking about how she, the president, several uh, people believe uh, certain things will occur between Russia and Ukraine And then also there's still an ability to prevent those things from happening, even though they're sure a decision has been made, uh, which is the oddest version of talking points I think I've ever heard. And then beyond that, beyond saying the things they're saying about the likelihood of an invasion, uh, she actually goes a step further when the reporter asks her, why not put sanctions in place that are a deterrent in your mind now as opposed to after the fact? And her answer is a jumbly mess. Uh, which, again, I probably surprises very few of us. But if you believe Putin has made up his mind, what leverage do you really have? Why not put those sanctions in place now? The purpose of the sanctions has always been and continues to be deterrence. But let's also recognize... <laughs> I, can't, I laugh every time I hear that first sentence. The purpose of the things we haven't done yet is to stop the guy from doing the thing that he needs to do for us to do the stuff to stop him. What? What did you? I'm positive. I said it the right way just back there. If you play the tape back, uh, that's the logic is we're going to do the deterrence after he's done the thing to deter him from doing the thing. (laughs) Hear more. The unique nature of the sanctions that we have outlined. These are some of the greatest sanctions, if not the the, the strongest that we've ever issued. You know, I actually I also hear uh, a ting of the former president uh, there for a second. These are the greatest. These are the best. Uh, That's how the vice president is talking now. These sanctions are the best sanctions. They're better than all the other sanctions. And we're going to use them in a way that you'll you'll be amazed by the sanctions of them uh, because they're going to be incredible. Uh, Does Vladimir Putin seem to care about them? To be determined is the answer there. Uh, But we're only going to do them if we have to and we really don't want to. And now she's going to sound afraid uh, for the rest of this answer, I believe. As I articulated yesterday, it, it is directed at institutions, in particular financial institutions, yeah. and individuals, and it will exact absolute harm for the Russian economy and their government. But if Putin has made up his mind, do you feel that this threat that has been looming is really going to deter him? Absolutely. We strongly believe, and, and remember also that the sanctions are a product not only of our perspective as the United States, but a shared perspective among our allies. 
and the allied relationship is such that we have agreed that the deterrence effect <laughs> of these sanctions is still a meaningful one, especially uh -huh. because, remember also, we still sincerely hope that there is a diplomatic path. We hope. That's what we hope right now. I don't know. What do you think is actually occurring? Let me just ask you that. I know you can't answer. I, I, I wish I could take a bunch of these uh, answers you're probably providing to your uh, radios right now, but I can't. Uh, what do you think is the inevitable end of all of this? If there never is an invasion, if there never is a a um, actual military attack and then a needed response, uh, which would scare a lot of us from our government, uh, was all of this created to demonstrate that our current president got us out of a thing that would have been bad that was never going to happen in the first place? If our country is creating this controversy for political reasons, Think about what they're doing. Uh, just contemplate that for a moment, that this president, this administration would be so willing to dabble in the likelihood of, of a military conflict that could arise to something tremendously significant solely to gain political points during a midterm election. Uh, we are in a scary place. We are in a uniquely challenging and scary place. And I'm not saying that all the polling numbers um, make it seem as though this current president shouldn't be desperate. Uh, to get whatever he can as far as support from the American people. Uh, but this is not the way to do it. And then if an, an action is taken, if a strike, if uh, an invasion does occur, and they are eventually right about the deadline after deadline that's been provided of when this will happen and how it will happen and how that has yet to actually occur, uh, then we also get into the world of how many deterrents will actually work, how much stuff will actually be implemented, and when, if ever, uh, are the enemies to this country or the enemies uh, that are created by something like that uh, going to fear actual military action? And you just look back at Afghanistan. You look back at the uh, previous failed operation to say to yourself, all right, uh, we're at a place where most of our most dangerous, say, um, uh, potential enemies have very little fear of a incredibly powerful country for what reason? There's only one reason to, to feel that way, and it's uh, the leaders, the people at the top. All right, I want to move on. I can't keep talking about uh, those stories all the time. I want to do this. Uh, this is a 94-year-old woman that goes snow uh, sledding, tubing for the first time ever. I love every part of this audio, every part of this experience, uh, because you're never too old for anything in life. I will tell you that, unless maybe uh, you're the president of the country. I think maybe if you're uh, struggling mentally, there might be... Uh, reasons you're too old for that gig. Uh, but even Biden could probably go tubing with uh, limited success. Uh, so here it is. Here's audio of the 94-year-old woman trying out uh, something unique and everybody being very excited uh, to see this through. All right, you ready to go tubing? Yeah, boy. Have you ever been tubing before? Uh, How old uh, are you? 94. 94. 94. All right, let's go tubing. <laughs> Oh, that was fun. That was fun. Good to hear. I love how, how nonchalant all of it is. And the yee-hoo is one of my favorite parts. <laughs> yee-hoo! <laughs> she sounded like she had a great time. Oh, that was fun. That was fun. All good right. That's great. You had a good time. You want to go back up? Let's do it again. I would love to have been there uh, for this, and I would love to have more stories like this to talk about. A 94-year-old woman uh, goes tubing for the first time, has a bunch of fun in the snow, and uh, the smile on her face, which maybe I'll put up on some social media pages for you, uh, is tremendous. And that's what we need uh, now. Maybe when everything gets stressful, uh, you find somebody to, to have a first experience with, whatever that might be. I don't know if we'll all be lucky enough to be able to go tubing with a 94-year-old woman. Uh, but you got to find something, do it, and just forget about everything that's going on uh, in the world. And actually, uh, it's funny, uh, this kind of touches on another thing I saw out there. Uh, the reason that so many people might not watch the Winter Olympics compared to the Summer Olympics I saw, because the ratings were terrible for that, is that a lot of us feel like we could be Winter Olympians. Uh, it's true. Uh, a significant amount of Americans, uh, whether it's curling and just uh, pushing the old broom, uh, feel as though, you know, we could do one of those sports. I wonder if this woman feels that way now. Uh, she's tubed once. Maybe she wants to cross-country ski in the near future. Uh, for the United States, uh, we came in fifth on the medal count in the Olympics, so we need all the help we can get uh, going forward. Uh, maybe she's the right one for the job. Uh, but I thought that was so interesting. Maybe one of the reasons we have limited interest is that we don't see it as challenging as the summer games. Uh, quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Give me a bowl of chili with plenty of peppers. One Mexican heartburn. Why don't you mugs grow up? 
The Chad Benson Show, where independent a la carte thinkers have a seat at the table and a voice in the dialogue. I'll have what she's having. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Chad is back tomorrow. Uh, Let's take a break from some of the serious news, and I'm just going to rapid fire from some other things, some sillier things I've seen out there. First one, uh, Danish police are seeking information about an escaped kangaroo. Uh, Police in Denmark on Monday appealed for public help in tracking down a rogue kangaroo uh, that was filmed hopping across a field and hasn't been seen since. Uh, Police said on Facebook that a driver saw uh, the kangaroo uh, at uh, early morning hours. Uh, they said the driver, whom they didn't identify, uh, I like that they kept his or her identity a secret, had the presence of mind to film the kangaroo and go ahead and send the three-second video in, uh, even though it is short and grainy, a la Bigfoot uh, type of video. Uh, nobody has reported a missing kangaroo, though, and people are concerned. Uh, maybe somebody picked up a pet. Uh, the COVID pet thing was was a thing for quite some time, and and some people went more rogue Uh, than others. I think I mentioned earlier on in the show today that I have a new puppy. I don't think it counts as a COVID puppy anymore as the pandemic feels very over uh, for many of us. I would never go kangaroo. I feel like out of all the things you could try to have as a pet in your home uh, or outside, maybe, uh, I think it'd have to be an outdoor pet. If It's a kangaroo. That one, that feels too tricky. Um, But police are still on the hunt uh, for (laughs) missing. I would want to be given a detail like that. I would want to spend my day uh, questioning people and, you know, showing photos of the kangaroo. Have you seen this kangaroo places? Uh, that feels like a fun way to waste my day. Uh, in other news, viral video, uh, a person on TikTok found a chili recipe, a complete chili recipe in the terms and conditions of an office episode on the streaming platform Peacock uh, for NBC. The reason this is put, and Mackenzie Floyd is her name, uh, who found the Easter egg there, is because apparently nobody reads any of this stuff. Uh, We just accept all of it, whether it's a streaming platform, a technology device, uh, whatever you have. The terms and conditions are silly. Uh, So halfway through them, apparently, uh, there is just a total chili recipe uh, a la The Office uh, that I recommend. It's Kevin's Famous Chili. Uh, It's something that uh, is in a casual Friday episode of the show. Um, I don't think I would make it myself. I'm not sure that I would have the skills necessary, uh, and I let my wife do all the cooking in our family uh, not because I'm not woke, because I'm terrible at cooking uh, for anyone that's about to write a hate letter. Uh, but it's out there. It's a long-running joke. And if you find it, uh, good luck to you in making it. I feel like we need more of that in the world of terms and conditions because uh, none of us do uh, read very, very many of those or any of those, to be honest. Uh, we skip over almost all of them. Uh, in other news, again, this is a, a bit of a reprieve from all the things that are serious in the day. Uh, let's call it a news palate cleanser. Uh, if you will. I like this one a lot. Uh, There's a Reddit page. Uh, If you know reddit.com, the website has a bunch of uh, subreddit pages where people go to talk about specific things. There's specific conversations. Now, there's one I love a lot. I call it Am I the Jerk? Uh, Because the other word I don't want to say, but it's not that word. It starts with an A. Someone went on there and said that they found out their neighbor had stolen their cat. This is a real story. The person asked, who's the jerk? 3.6 million people uh, got involved in this conversation, or at least I think uh, most of the the subscribers to that channel uh, reacted to this story. Maybe not all 3.6 million, uh, but the person asked a simple question, am I the jerk for stealing my cat back from my neighbor at 3 a.m.? So this person found out that they had their pet. Uh, they didn't know how long that it occurred for, but the pet had been missing for a little while. Fluffy Butt is the pet's name. <laughs> Uh, which maybe, if that's part of the issue, maybe that's why the cat fled, is that they were given a name like Fluffy Butt. Uh, But uh, apparently some neighbors even might have seen some of this and been terrified about it. Uh, The individual decided that it was time to get their cat back. So at 3 a.m., they snuck into their neighbor's house, took the cat, and ran! They got out. Uh, They now have their cat back. I think they can identify it uh, with microchips and whatnot. So it's definitely their pet and not the neighbor's. Uh, But the question becomes, was it right to go this far to get your pet back? Most people on the Internet think the person was right. Stealing her cat back, uh, stealing their cat back uh, made sense, even if the job had to be pulled at 3 a.m. a la Ocean's Eleven uh, or whatnot. I love every part of this story. I don't know why uh, you have to take somebody else's pet 
I don't know what the reason is. I'm sure there's a bunch of information uh, we may or may not know, uh, including why the pet's name is Fluffy Butt. That's something that should not occur. Uh, people should say no. Actually, I adopted my dog from a, a uh, local uh, shelter, and the initial name given to my, my pet puppy uh, was um, uh, Kissy Face, and I also dislike that name tremendously. Fluffy Butt and Kissy Face, both kind of similar to me, um, but you shouldn't steal uh, a pet from a neighbor. You shouldn't just keep it, especially if you know it's theirs, although maybe they didn't. Uh, maybe there's some way in which one neighbor was unaware it was the other neighbor's pet, and the whole thing could have been avoided. I'm not sure, uh, but that's what the internet cares about today, and that's what I want to talk about as much as I can. Quick break, a lot more. Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. Independent thoughts, independent life. This is Chad Benson. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in. Elizabeth Warren and Elon Musk have a feud now. Uh, It's gone on for a little while. I don't know exactly why it's a thing that exists as significantly as it does. Elon has won many of the battles, though. Uh, Here's Elizabeth once again talking about the billionaires and the lack of taxes they pay and whatnot and how Elon is one of the problems, (laughs) according to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, She's even corrected at one point, not in the uh, tax uh, part of the conversation, uh, but in what she's breaking bad against and with the things uh, that Elon is actually donating uh, as part of uh, what he said he would do uh, to help uh, the world, to help others. Uh, but this is enough for, El- for Elizabeth, excuse me, for Warren to go rogue and talk about how bad it is and how all these uh, tax breaks that exist are just something we need to tie up loose ends on. You know who also said that, uh, by the way, to simplify tax codes, uh, to make it harder to come up with all these different ways to get around them? Former President Donald Trump. Uh, But here's Elizabeth. I also believe, however, that billionaires ought to be paying taxes, and it shouldn't simply be optional. You know, what we've now seen is both giant corporations and billionaires have enough tricks in the tax code. Because he's, just to be clear, he's donating the stock, right? Instead of the, he's donating the stock. That's right. But part of what happens right now is that, for example, Elon Musk, 2018, we've actually seen his tax returns. You know how much he paid in taxes? One of the richest people in the world? Zero. And he's not the only one. Uh, Jeff Bezos, right, another one of the richest people in the world, he pays less in taxes than a public school teacher uh, or a firefighter. And they do this because they're only being taxed on income. They very cleverly make sure they have no (laughs) official income. Uh They just have all this stock that keeps building in value, building in value. And it's so bad. And we need it to change. We need it to stop. Uh, These people who have a lot of money could never just uh, leave. They could never just uh, uh, turn around and go and uh, stop creating a whole bunch of jobs and value uh, for us. So we need to find a way to tax them way more money. And then everything will be free and everyone will be great. Um, That's essentially the talking point. And actually, Elon Musk has even pushed back on this by saying he has paid taxes. He's paid more taxes than anyone else uh, in the country at times. um, Because, again, uh, those narrative, those speaking points don't necessarily need to be true for Democrats to say them. They just need to be part of the conversation. But what an odd feud, in all honesty. It's almost as odd as Kanye West versus Peppa Pig, which is another thing out there I mentioned earlier. I'm not going to talk about it again, but Google it. Apparently, it's a thing. Uh, most of the Internet sides with Peppa, uh, which I love so much. I want to touch on this just briefly. Uh, the CDC is under scrutiny for collecting a wide variety of COVID-related data, uh, but publishing only a very small, tiny fraction of it. Even the New York Times is saying that one of the problems now for the CDC is a lack of transparency at a time when uh, the things they're advising, the way in which they they move at a pace that seems ridiculously slow in changing their mind uh, when several different uh, states, cities, uh, pretty much everywhere in the United States uh, is changing their mind and a lot of CDC mandates or, excuse me, uh, vaccine 
or mask mandates, uh, that this organization still tremendously slow. And why hide all of this data? Why keep so much information to themselves? Uh, why uh, is the question. The answer probably easy for a lot of us to come to. And yet um, uh, it's one that I'm sure uh, we might never know uh, the actual uh, valid or lack thereof uh, reason why all this data seems to be inappropriate to put out there, breaking down data based on age, race, vaccination status. Uh, this is just a reminder uh, earlier in February, we also found out that if you're of a certain age, uh, these booster shots are tremendously less valuable to you uh, than people in at-risk uh, uh, parts of the population. As we're having argument after argument about kids and vaccines and whatnot, more and more data is saying how little of, of these things matter. I'm not anti-vaccine. I want to ba- make that abundantly clear. Uh, I'm just saying that there's more and more information that's just widely ignored And this is from the people who said they were always letting science lead the conversation as long as they think they can tell you the science is what they want it to be and not if it changes to to not be right. And uh, obviously in that world, uh, we've had a lot of conversations about whether or not the science has even changed. Uh, All right. I want to move on to other things. I am sick of talking about some of the news of the day. Last week, I saw a story uh, that Robert Pattinson, who's going to play Batman in an upcoming movie, I bumped into Christian Bale, a guy who played Batman in a movie, a few movies, and asked for a tip as far as playing the character. And the one actor told the other, make sure your suit has a way for you to go to the restroom as easily as possible. Just make that a thing. It's going to disrupt your ability to play the character. If partway through, you need to hit the bathroom and it's too difficult to do it. Uh, Now we have Tom Holland, who plays Spider-Man, talking about getting his mother involved and making sure he got the amount of bathroom breaks he needed. This is on Live with Kelly and Ryan. I don't know when the superhero conversation, at least for actors, uh, was much more focused on bathroom breaks than anything else. And I don't know if that takes away from all the magic that is of seeing these superheroes that some of us might have grown up idolizing on screen, uh, realizing that for most of these people, uh, playing these roles, the the bathroom. Uh, but I would be focused on it. I'm not judging because uh, I'm just saying that, yeah, if you had to put on a ridiculous costume for several hours a day, I would want to make sure that I had uh, the ability uh, to go ahead and take those breaks when needed. I don't think I'd rope mom in, though. I don't think I'd get mom involved in helping me uh, have those breaks as much as possible. On the first right. movie, I remember we were shooting this sequence on the sta- uh, on the Washington Monument and I was in the suit for days at a time, sort of 11 hours, and I was young, so I wanted to impress the studio. I didn't want them to think that I needed breaks. And I remember calling my mum up on our daily phone calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, Mom, I'm really struggling. Like, I'm working every day, and because I wear the suit, I can't go to the bathroom. And then two days later, the producer came up to me and was like, how are your kidneys? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. I was like, yeah. My kidneys are You're fine. Good. Why are you asking? He's like, well, your mom called us. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Okay, again, I'm not trying to shatter the uh, illusion that is uh, people playing superheroes and us uh, liking them. I know that they're tremendously popular movies, and I am a comic book book and superhero nerd. Uh, But it is something when the guy playing Spider-Man has his mom make a phone call so he can go to the bathroom more times. That is something. Uh, I'm glad I didn't hear about that before seeing the Spider-Man movie. It might have hit different. That's all I'm saying. Uh, In other news, I saw this story a few days ago and wanted to just touch on it quickly. Uh, There is a jail, uh, this is in Geneva, that is looking for volunteers to test it out. This is real. Uh, The March 24th to 27th test run uh, to whether or not this jail is working correctly received 832 applicants. A yet determined number will actually be used as volunteers. You had to live locally, be 18 years old, and be willing to be imprisoned for several days. You would test things like the food, undergo intake procedures that could be strip search and whatnot, uh, walk the yard, a bunch of different things. The volunteers can't bring cell phones or other devices inside. Every participant will require security clearance and need to undergo checks similar to airport screenings. Uh, Strip searching, as I said, is one of the things that could occur. Uh, You do have to volunteer for that as well. Uh, The stunt doubles will receive (laughs) (laughs) – I wish that the the prisoners, excuse me, probably wish they'd get this – a safe word. Uh, The stunt doubles can use the safe word with staff if they want to get out of any situation that they find themselves in while in prison for a few days. Uh, Next month's trial one will enable correction officers to test the capacity, services, and operations of the jail there. 
Are we at a weird place? And I know this isn't the United States, uh, but a weird place in our society, our world, uh, when 832 people want to go to jail for fun for three days. Is that a weird place uh, to be in when they're like, yeah, this sounds great. Uh, It's, you know, time to get away. Maybe you suggest it to you and the missus. You go together, do a weekend in prison uh, in a Swiss jail and just have, you know, uh, the time of your lives. And you get a safe word uh, to make sure that everything's on the up and up as much as it can be. Um, I am amazed at the. I don't see any amount of pay for this. You make no money. It's just honestly people who are going to go try it out. Uh, They were even thinking about making it into a reality TV show because it sounds like a plot of one. Uh, But for now, it's just going to be a a test run of the old jail. Would anyone apply for that here in the United States? Would anyone want to go and be like, yeah, I want to know what it's like to eat the food and live in some place that's supposed to be bad and the reason that bad guys don't do bad things? I want to try that out. Uh, It sounds like a great time. And then actually, uh, to take this one step further, Uh, because I loved this story so much when I saw it. I think if you uh, volunteer for this, you got to try to do the jailbreak. You got to go full road. You have to find a way, plot with some others there. You got to break out, because if you can do that, that's the most valuable information they're looking for uh, more than anything else. But honestly, even like, do we turn it into um, uh, some sort of like rating system for this? Do you wind up getting your own amount of stars for the jail? Food, not great. Uh, Jail, uh, very not great. Uh, All things that I did not enjoy being in here. So you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Or if you get a real positive review, one of the volunteers is like, I had a great time. Food was delicious. Uh, The bed in my cell was really comfy. I think you got to go back and change some things. You do not want positive reviews in this scenario. But I just couldn't get over that, that so many people wanted in on something that seems uh, ridiculous in every single way. And it maybe it's just, again, uh, people are frustrated with the others around them, uh, frustrated in society, and even in uh, somewhere like Geneva, they're like, you know what, that's fine, lock me up for three days, uh, I'll have a great time, and I'll be out back into the real world, which seems worse uh, somehow to some. Uh, not me. Again, I'm not agreeing with all these things. I'm just uh, trying to project how we got there uh, anywhere in the world where people were down for this. All right, I got to take a break. A lot more coming up. Uh, Craig Collins filling in on the Chad Benson Show. No snowflake zone. Uninformed opinions are in danger of melting. The Chad Benson Show. This is the Chad Benson Show. My name is Craig Collins filling in another roundup of sillier things out there in the news. And I start with this. Uh, Four in ten people admit, admit, excuse me, to test tasting their pet's food. Um, A poll of 2004. I don't know why they chose that extra four. Uh, Cat and dog owners found that 61% have lost sleep over the thought of their pet eating something they shouldn't. Uh, As someone with a brand new puppy that is uh, not trying to find topics to talk about, uh, to mention my new dog, I promise I'm not trying to do it. Uh, They're just popping up. Uh, I get some of these concerns, although I don't lose any sleep uh, over that fact. I try to do my best, and then you live with uh, whatever happens in life. 39% were even caught, uh, have caught their pet rummaging through the trash. Uh, And then, of course, as I said, about 4 in 10 Test the food. Uh, I don't know why this is a thing we would do. I remember my mother uh, used to very fondly tell a story about being a kid, about really wanting dog food or a doggy treat of some kind, and her mother trying to stop her from getting it. Uh, Much like anybody who has a dog uh, knows that when you're trying to prevent that dog from doing something, uh, whether it's eat food you have on the table or whatnot, it's a bit of a game. It's a bit of a, it almost is like you're boxing out before a rebound in the world of basketball. Uh, and it takes a little while. Uh, but my mother eventually succeeded in having her doggy treat as a child and said that it wasn't so bad uh, to this day. Uh, but she doesn't do it anymore. Uh, and I don't think, <laughs> I love that I had to throw that out there. She doesn't do it anymore. Don't worry, people. She's not on dog food all the time. Uh, but a lot of people, I, I guess, are in the same boat. I've never got that. I've never been somebody that wanted to know what any of that tasted like. Even when you get the fancier stuff, even when you're grabbing the the bacon flavored, whatever it is uh, that some of us might turn to for our pets, uh, no part of that to me uh, looks like food I want in my own mouth. Uh, in other news, and I like this story a lot just because there's so many of these, these viral TikTok things uh, out there, these viral debates on 
on uh, companies, what they're doing, what they're not doing. Uh, this is real. Last week, this uh, this TikTok post went viral of this Amazon worker, uh, this person who claimed to be an Amazon worker, laying down on the floor and going to sleep in their workspace. Uh, this would be in a warehouse and touting how lovely their company was. Uh, actually, this is, again, the stuff that was both commented on and in the video. I'd play it, but the audio is not very valuable and uh, you won't be able to see it. It's radio. Um, but the essential takeaway was Amazon treats us like family. If you get tired during your shift, you're allowed to just lay down and sleep on the floor in whatever work position uh, you're in. You can take a nap. You can take a, a bigger break than that, I guess. It's just one of the rules that allows you uh, to, to live your life correctly uh, while work in the old warehouse. Odd timing, as there's been quite a few stories out there about bad treatment and whatnot. Uh, Amazon facilities that are are dealing with some legal challenges, too. And I will say this, that that's not how I treat my family. If someone is tired during their shift at work or someone is tired while they're spending time with me, uh, just, you know, having fun, I usually let them sleep in an actual bed. I'm not recommending Amazon gets beds, uh, but if we're overworked that much, I also might just let them go home. Uh, what interests me the most, though, about this is how many people started to think that it wasn't actually an Amazon employee that worked in the uh, warehouse. It was probably an HR representative for the company putting out a video to try to uh, tout one of the odd benefits for the company. So this was an active decision, uh, if those people are right, uh, made by Amazon uh, to go ahead and start social media buzz around something that I would not be proud of. Because uh, I love that, too. Uh, these tech companies, these social media places and whatnot have all these weird kind of things that uh, I think younger employees are looking for in their workplace to make it feel more and more like not a workplace. Or I guess a lot of people who just want to work from home now uh, can't do that, can't pull that off. If you work in a factory, you're going to have to go into that job. Uh, but I wouldn't be proud of this. This is not something that I'd throw out there and say a, a interview as one of the core benefits. Uh, by the way, if you ever need to, you can just lay down on the floor and take a few a minute nap. Uh, you can sleep off whatever you want and uh, no one will mind. Uh, we promise that we'll let you do that as much as need be. I, I just loved every part of that story and the buzz that was created about it on social media. And I do wonder uh, moving forward if that's the kind of thing you hear about more. Maybe it winds up in a commercial. Uh, maybe Amazon eventually is like, we're the place that lets our employees sleep on the floor. Uh, look at how great we are. Uh, one other one, uh, this is a social media debate that uh, went viral. I guess a couple millennial parents uh, were foregoing spood feeding an infant, so instead they gave the infant a hunk of chicken <laughs> is what this says. I'm not laughing because I, I, you know, enjoy uh, anybody in any danger. I don't have any kids. I don't know exactly how big the risk is, but um, the TikTok tag baby uh, lead we uh, weaning, uh, which I guess has a bunch of different videos on it, has almost 100 million views. Uh, that is a tag of a bunch of different videos. Uh, but one of these videos discovered that became tremendously popular uh, was a set of 24-year-old parents uh, that gave their kid essentially a, um, a chicken leg uh, to uh, gnaw on, and everybody said how terrible this parenting was. I don't know. Here's the thing. The biggest thing I'll react to. I don't know why the younger generations, I'm a millennial, so this is some self-hate, uh, but Gen Z as well, put everything on social media, uh, every single thing. If something bad happens, if you're dealing with something, even if you get fired or something from a job now, it's common to put all of that up on social media and then deal with, I guess, the backlash. Uh, these parents, and whether or not they should let their kid, quote, gnaw on a chicken leg, uh, didn't need to be in any kind of news at all. Didn't need to be mentioned on this show or any of them. Uh, but they're the ones putting the video out there that's getting all the backlash. And I just think that's so interesting. And again, it's also that viral and probably more interesting to me uh, move of quitting your job in epic fashion and putting it up on social media. Uh, doesn't anyone who does that know it makes it tremendously unlikely of you getting hired in the future? I don't think they do. Uh, this is Craig Collins filling in Chad Benson show. This is the Chad Benson Show.